Hey guys, welcome back to another q and day. It is August 17th, 2020, and this week the questions kind of got out of hand. I think there was about double the questions that I wanted. Um, I try to post in the threads to cut it off, but I know people don't always read it or see it. So what we're going to do is two parts. So this will be part one. <laughs> that way this video isn't like 45 minutes long. Okay, so part one, I'm just going to do pretty much half the questions and then we'll do the uh, other half on part two. All right. Let's see here. All right, so if a woman is trying to conceive and she is a female competitor and is currently on Novadex and Anavar, would you recommend coming off everything before trying to conceive again. Well, first off, I am not a doctor, so that sounds like a good question for their doctor, but I can tell you hypothetically, just from a uh, hormonal or endocrine standpoint, that yeah, it's just gonna be just like a male, there's gonna be disruption in the endocrine system. Um, so it could potentially make it harder to conceive. Now, is it impossible? Definitely not. But there's potential for um, no ovulation, especially with the Anivar, uh, you know, because you're shutting down, potentially shutting down some ovarian function, uh, shutting down LH and FSH. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, they're going to have a better chance coming off, right? And not only that, but it's probably going to be a much, um, word for it, healthier or smoother experience coming off. Now, with that in mind, too, it's not always an instant thing to regain normal um, endocrine function right when they come off. So they might not, for example, they might not come right off and be completely normal. It may take a couple months or more even in some cases. So the best, best scenario would probably be coming off and then waiting for a few months or whatever it takes to really gain or regain a completely normal menstrual cycle. So that's, that would probably be ideal. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Oh, another Dave Kallick death, uh, death metal corner here. So Dave's death metal corner. Would you label obituary as death metal or thrash? Mm. Um, I think traditionally they would be labeled as a death metal band, but I know death metal has changed a little bit in terms of the sound and there are so many more subgenres now, they might be considered a little bit more thrash now than maybe they were originally, which I probably would have said they were death metal. There's so many, like I said, there's so many subgenres that gets so confusing to me and there's so much overlap. But I would say that they're pretty much death metal. I'd say they're in a very traditional sense. That's what they are. Um, they do pop up on my... Uh, um, Pandora playlist quite often. So, <laughs> yes, good old obituary. All right. What blue blocker glasses do you recommend? <clears throat> I bought some cheap ones before and my vision was very poor with them, even with wearing my contacts. I would use them for reading and light TV. And someone else adds, I second this question. Okay, so two votes, a couple votes for that question. Um, raw optics are what I use and what I recommend. I wish I had my pair here to show you, but uh, or in the other room. But yeah, raw optics, optics it's R-A optics. And if you look on 
every podcast episode that I post for the OPD podcast, there is a mention of Raw Optics because they are a sponsor of ours and there is a code on there that you can use. They are probably the best out there in terms of the frequencies uh, that they block. So you're actually getting something that's going to block a large amount of blue light and isn't just like some tented lens that looks funny on your face, right? These actually do what they say they're supposed to do and they do block the, um, the blue light that we want blocked. So I would suggest them. They have several different styles. Um, they have a daytime version, which is a little bit lighter. They have a nighttime version, which is a little bit more pronounced. So, yeah, that's what I would suggest. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Front versus rear foot elevated split squat. How do they affect the muscles hit? Oh, well, and typically front foot front of foot elevated would be uh, elongating like the posterior, right? Because it is, it's not gonna use my arm very well. You know, this wrist doesn't even bend that far. This one bends a little farther. So up, right, that's gonna stretch the calf, that's gonna stretch the hamstring, clear up into the glute posterior, right? So you're probably going to get a little bit more uh, glute hamstring activation there. Now, some of that also depends on knee flexion because if you have less knee flexion, as in your foot, best way to explain that would be if, if the stance is really far apart, you're probably going to have less knee flexion, right? So you're going to get a little bit less um, quad activation that way and a little bit more glute and hamstring activation. But generally front foot elevated would be a little more on the hamstring side, glute, glute ham. Whereas a rear foot elevated would generally cause more quad activation. But like I said, the second, <clears throat> really the second variable there, second main variable would also just be the, knee, the knee, amount of knee flexion. Let's see if I can say that without sounding like a dummy. Amount of knee flexion. So, you know, bend versus way over the toe. So that whole idea of don't take your knee over your toe is kind of silly because knee flexion is what causes a lot of the quad activation. So yeah, as long as you have tension on the muscle and you're using the muscle to work through range of motion, you're not, you know, you're not really going to cause any harm to your joint at that point. I'm not talking about a barbell squat, we're talking about a split squat, we're talking about even leg presses, right? you can create a large amount of knee flexion or certain leg machines, right? So yeah, that's typically gonna be the difference between a front foot, front of foot and rear of foot elevation and the uh, difference in um, muscle activation in the actual limb, the leg limb, right? Okay. How detrimental to recovery is doing a conditioning session after your main workout of resistance training? For context, conditioning 25 to 35 minutes of exercises such as calories on the rower, bike, ski, burpees, kettlebell swings, lunges, press-ups, etc. Resistance session is lower volume, high intensity, Total time for sessions is, for both sessions, is uh, hour 30 to two hours max. Sleep, nutrition, etc., is on point. Thanks. Well, I, I, would, I would generally say not detrimental. I don't see why it would be. Uh, if you have adequate protein, you have adequate uh, time for nervous system recovery adequate time in a parasympathetic state. <clears throat> I mean, it wouldn't see why it would be detrimental. Uh, people have been doing cardio in several different fashions post-workout for years, right? So, I mean, cause cardio generally, all right, well, 
they said conditioning, so I don't know if they're like solely looking for um, metabolic conditioning or cardiovascular conditioning, where they're actually trying to increase their cardiovascular uh, capacity so they can do some kind of sport, or are they literally just trying to do cardio to burn calories? Because really for physique enhancement, a lot of what cardio is, is caloric expenditure if we're talking outside the health realm, right? So how you achieve that is kind of irrelevant, right? Now, obviously different intensities or different, um, different heart rate, if you wanna use like the heart rate zone idea, they do um, tap into different energy substrates, right? At some point it will become more glucose intensive, at some point it's more lipid intensive. So does it make a difference? Yeah, kinda, but in this, you know, in this context, I doubt it's you know it's it's detrimental. And really you can gauge it yourself. You're you're asking if it's uh detrimental to recovery. Well, you're gonna know. I mean, is it how is your recovery? Are you recovering? Are you progressing within your weight training sessions? Are you are signs of recovery poor, like excessive soreness, CNS fatigue? Is there something going on that would make you ask this question or is it just general curiosity? Because I would probably just say, no, you're fine. I don't see any real issue there. <clears throat> okay. Next one, this will be the last one for uh, part one and then We'll do a part two next. All right. For maximum results, does GH need to be taken at the same time with insulin or can you take GH morning and insulin post-workout? Oh man. Yeah, you can split them, but there's a lot of things missing here. What analog are you talking about of insulin? What's me the meal timing like? What is your blood glucose? What are all these things? Like, I don't know any of these variables, but no, they do not have to be taken together. So I guess the rest of it really just depends on context. But uh, yeah, that's it for part one, guys. I will catch all you guys in part two.